The F-86 Sabre is a legend. First flying in 1947, it was arguably the best of the first generation jet fighters, with the Soviet MiG-15 being the main rival for the claim. These two aircraft famously fought one another in duels throughout the Korean War, and the Sabre was to prove such a stalwart that it would continue in frontline service until 1994. But the Sabre, in common with many of the early jets, had a serious flaw, its range. For the United States Air Force, committed to a policy of strategic and nuclear bombing in the immediate Second World War era, this was a problem. Their bomber fleet was principally made up of B-29s, B-50s and the newly arriving B-45 Tornado, all of which were expected to be conducting long-range missions. This problem would only get worse once the projected Northrop B-35 flying wing and the B-36 got into service with their transcontinental ranges. Experience from the Second World War had taught the USAAF that really, they needed escort fighters for their bombers to ensure they got through to the targets. But with their limited range, the new jets couldn't provide that. A range of experimental types were developed to try to remedy this situation. First, and even before the end of the war, there were attempts to build dual-powered aircraft, such as the Ryan XF-2R Dark Shark and the Consolidated Volte XP-81, which combined a turbojet for speed and a turboprop for range. This was followed by proposals to build bigger jets that could carry enough fuel, such as the Bell XP-83, and even by the resurrection of the concept of bombers to carry their own parasite fighters, typified by the XF-85 Goblin. But none of these were really suitable, generally having far inferior performance to any expected opposition. In 1946, the USAAF, as it still was then, was deeply concerned about the issue and requested that a new penetration fighter be built for their requirements. This would be a long-range fighter with a combat radius of at least 900 miles and be capable of going toe-to-toe with opposing jet fighters. In essence, what they wanted was the jet equivalent of the P-51 Mustang. The requirement pushed what was technologically feasible, and only two companies fielded proposals, McDonnell, with their XF-88 Voodoo, and Lockheed, with their XF-90. To carry the fuel required, both aircraft were large, twin-engine affairs, but that was the necessary trade-off, and both aircraft had prototypes ordered for testing. But North American... Designers and builders of both the P-51 and the F-86 was also looking closely at the USAF's penetration fighter requirement, and they thought that they could win the contract. In late 1947, they proposed a version of what was then the newest and most capable fighter then undergoing development for the USAF, the F-86A Sabre, or P-86 as it was then designated at the time. Now, as I've already said, the Sabre doesn't seem a very good match for the specification. The F-86 was a small, single-engine day fighter built for performance rather than range. But in fact, North American were to offer a radical update to the basic design, which meant that though they initially designated the aircraft as the F-86C, it was quickly going to be recognised as an aircraft in its own right, and be redesignated as the YF-93A. From the Sabre, the YF-93 retained the wings and tail assembly, but that was about it. The fuselage was substantially larger, which was needed to carry the extra fuel for the aircraft's primary mission as a long-range escort fighter. In fact, the theoretical range of the YF-93 with drop tanks was over 2,000 miles, around twice that of the early F-86. The extra loading in turn required a more powerful engine, and the original J-47 of the early F-86A, which produced 4,850 pounds of force, was replaced by a Pratt & Whitney J-48. This was a license-built version of the British Tay engine, and produced 8,000 pounds of force with the afterburner. Armament for the YF-93 was also more formidable than its forebear, with the Sabre's 650 caliber Browning heavy machine guns switched out for 6.20mm cannon. But the most notable change was to the aircraft's nose. Instead of using the open inlet like the Sabre, the YF-93 relocated the air inlets to the fuselage sides, 
with the nose used to accommodate an SCR-720 interception radar. The inlets were of NACA duct design, intended to provide a more efficient and streamlined air intake than scoop intakes that were more common at the time. All of this meant that the aircraft's weight was much heavier than the Sabre, and the landing gear also was beefed up to compensate, using twin wheels for the main gear, rather than the single wheels as used by the F-86. In December 1947, the USAF ordered two prototypes, and then, in June 1948, added orders for 118 production aircraft. Apparently, the Air Force favoured the design because of its commonality with the Sabre, but in contrast to that, they then acknowledged that the aircraft was so far removed from the original aircraft that it got the aforementioned change of designation. Go figure. Regardless, things look good for the F-93A's prospects. But just as suddenly as the decision to buy was made, so was the decision to cancel. In February 1949, the USAF dropped its requirement for a penetration fighter. This was attributed to a large cut in the military budget in that year, but also that the USAF was planning to soon introduce the new Boeing B-47 Stratojet into service. This, and the even more ambitious follow-up design, the projected B-52, would fly too high and too fast for enemy interceptors, rendering the need for escorts unnecessary. Or so was thought at the time. However, although officially not needing penetration fighters anymore and cancelling the production contract, the United States Air Force still had orders in for prototypes full of three selected designs. And so the program continued in a more low-key, and arguably more sensible, fashion. As a result, the YF-93 first flew in January 1950. They appear to have proven to be solid aircraft. Top speed recorded was 708 miles per hour. The expected range requirements were met, and both aircraft flew with few problems, from what limited information is available on the testing program. The one issue that seems to have arisen was in the use of the novel NACA air inlets. Though intended to improve performance due to better streamlining, in fact, in high angles of attack, the airflow to the engine was disrupted, and scoop inlets were considered superior for air combat. As it was, this turned out to be largely irrelevant to any hopes for an actual production order. In the summer of 1950, the USAF conducted a fly-off amongst the three competing designs to see which was best. And as it was, the McDonald XF-88 won. Ultimately, this meant nothing, as the war in Korea was now raging. Though their military budget had been much restored by the conflict, the USAF was fully committed to buying aircraft for use in combat, and that did not require any of these aircraft. The specification was therefore shelved, though the XF-88 would see further development to eventually become the F-101 Voodoo. But the YF-93 was very much surplus to requirements. However, the two aircraft built did prove rather useful. They were transferred to the NACA for further testing, before being used as chase aircraft for the new fighters and bombers then under development, the Century series, which would start to come into service from the mid-1950s. Having successfully performed this one duty, Both YF-93s would finally be phased out in the late 1950s and subsequently be scrapped.